Okay. Atamare, everyone. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit today about how to navigate a complex world. And this is the answer, I believe, is to build up simple rules. And if you look at the natural world, that there is a very complex environment. And the computational capacity of biological beings is quite limited. And the way they do it is that they adapt over many iterations simple rules and encode them into biology. So if you're a plant and you want to maximize the amount of sunlight your leaves can receive while still not using too many resources, a really good rule is when you need to branch out, branch out at about 137 degrees. And that happens to be a Fibonacci number and the golden ratio and the golden mean and that sort of thing. But it's a very simple rule with a very powerful and a very approximate to perfect uh, capacity for maximizing your what you can draw in. And the Fibonacci sequence and nature and whatnot, that was one of the big, the big inspirations for me in choosing the word in spiral and spirals. And for me, this is the first simple rule I would recommend to all of us is learn from the natural world. In every being, in every system, in space, in physics, in mathematics, in biology, in water, there is deep wisdom which we can all learn from. And when we're trying to navigate complex things, there's a lot of knowledge we can draw on. I'm also going to share a little bit about some of the things I've learned about Aotearoa. I came here in 2004, and things I've learned in Aotearoa. So one of the things that I didn't know when I came here was that there are no endemic mammals in this country. That basically it was birds and insects which filled the ecological niches that mammals filled in other places. And that was a cause of, uh, that, that led to a very unique ecosystem, a very uh, fascinating ecosystem, but also a very fragile one. And one of the consequences of that is that when mammals did come in, like stoats, like rats, like possums, that they devastated that ecosystem. One of the side simple rules of this is that I learned about uh, invasive predators from ZIP, Zero Invasive Predators, an organization which the Next Foundation have backed and found. And a simple rule I highly recommend to all of you is follow the work of the Next Foundation. This is quite direct and specific simple rules. They'll be speaking today, so it's quite easy to do. But if you follow the work of people who are doing a lot of working and scanning and backing, you can just find amazing people, amazing projects, which will shape your knowledge, and you can also help out on. So follow Next Foundation is a great one. But stoats, they're fascinating. They're amazing creatures, highly adapted, beautiful specimens of biology. But in this ecosystem, they devastated. Kahu, the eagle on the right, they came here about a thousand years ago, just after Māori came. When Māori came, there was a bit of, little bit of land clearing, and these um, uh, birds work well in more open spaces. And they came, and they did not devastate the ecosystem. They fit into the ecosystem. They adapted to it. And one of the best simple rules from the natural world is don't destroy your ecosystem. And I think it, it's a simple one, right? But if you look at how you apply this to the world of business, is that these individuals and these species, they try to survive. They try to get the resources they need and they try to reproduce, like many businesses do. But they don't destroy the competition, they don't destroy the ecosystem, they live in harmony with it. And I think if our business was more ecological, we would be able to have a sound economy as well as a sound ecology. Another thing I didn't know when I came to this country was this is the Treaty of Waitangi. This is the, some images of it, nine documents. And I didn't know much about it when I showed up. And I'm so grateful for the last three days of the, the voicing of the treaty in the colonization times. And one of the things I didn't know about the treaty was that one of the rules in the treaty was that only the Crown is allowed to buy land from Māori. And that was there to protect Māori, because in other colonisations, settlers come in and they do dodgy deals, they buy land for unfair values and it's deeply unfair. The intent of that was pretty good. The, implement, the implementation of that was appalling. And the problem wasn't the intent. And there were lots of other complex issues with the treaty and I really encourage you to research it. It's a very important thing to know as you come to this land. But one of the things, as the treaty was not honoured, this led to over 20 years of war. I didn't know that when I came to this country. And again, I'd encourage you to look into this history and look into this time. Skipping forward 100 years and lots of things that you can research and learn, we come to the Treaty of the, the Waitangi Tribunal. And so we have a process in this country of settling a treaty, settling breaches in a treaty. And one of the most powerful statements I've learned from this is treaties are designed to be honored, not settled. And the, our country, coming to grips with the breaches of that history is a real thing in New Zealand and it's a complex thing, it's super complex. 
And learning how to navigate it is something which takes some simple rules. This is the two cent coin. And I learned a new word when I researched this, demonetization. It was demonetized in 1990. It was no longer worth anything. No one would accept it because it was too small. But two cents in the dollar is what Māori have received through the settlement process, demonstrable economic harm. So a fraction of the measurable economic things that were taken illegally, without a doubt. Not any of the other harm that was, was uh, inflicted. Two cents in the dollar. I didn't know that. It's good to know. I'll let you read this. So many people in New Zealand society, this is 2008, did not think Māori should be compensated at all, did not think the treaty should be part of our legal framework. About the same number of people thought that it should be, but it's a massive amount of the population. It's such a divisive cultural issue. And it can seem shocking to read this in this environment where it's like, wow, how could anyone think that's the case? It's surprising. But that's the culture and society of Aotearoa. These numbers are why I choose to live here. Because if you look at any other colonized country in the world, the numbers are worse. Do this survey in Australia, in the USA, in Africa. Look at the consequences of colonization and Aotearoa has come out the strongest, the best. And we've still got so much work to do. Because when you look at global history, we suffered hundreds of years of European colonization and it ravaged the world and inflicted so much harm. And it's a complex thing and lots went on, but the biggest process of decolonization is we need to decolonize our legal structures and our financial systems and the cultural harm. But mostly I feel we need to decolonize our language and our thoughts because the th everyone involved in this time thought they were doing the right thing. Everyone's intentions were like, I'm either doing the thing I think is right or the only thing I think I can do. I have no other choices. That was all sides of it. And it's easy to judge from today's perspective in history, but people were trying to do the right thing with good intentions. And the consequences were massive. So a simple rule for me is study history and learn from it. But I believe this land is one of the best places to heal the consequences of those hundreds of years of colonization and that the skills and the capabilities we need to do to heal that culturally, financially, legally, in all ways, are the same skills and capabilities we need to solve climate change, to solve global poverty. If we can do one, the same capabilities will be able to fix so many of the things that we want to fix. So, and I got a new simple rule over the last few days, um, and this one is like, be more like Mathieu. It was, it was such a, we were all so inspired by, by Mathieu. So, everyone, can you say taonga? Taonga. Taonga. Kapai. So, taonga <laughs> is roughly translated, or well, there are several translations, but one of them is treasure. So, heirlooms, arts, crafts, things of value, treasures is one translation of it. So, beautiful instruments or things which are crafted. Another translation for taonga is a thought or a memory. And something amazing or something significant happened in this country in the late 80s the New Zealand Parliament rec uh, recognised Te Reo Māori as a taonga, as a treasure that needed to be protected under their obligations of the treaty. And so many people have done amazing work um, in this to, to get Te Reo Māori to where it is today. But <clears throat> more work is needed. And if you ever bump into the movement, there are people today working on how do we give every child, every adult in New Zealand the easy opportunity and the right to learn to reo Māori at school. And that's a movement, if you ever bump into, help it. Help it by any means. And you'll hear critics of it with the 40% you know, of people who have a different view of saying, you're forcing us all to become Māori, and it's not the case at all. It's just the right to learn it easily. And it will be a fantastic thing if we can achieve that in the next decade. This is Aoraki. Can you say Aoraki? the largest mountain in New Zealand, in Aotearoa. And one of the other uh, translations of Taonga is translated as natural resources, the natural world. So you'll read that translation. And I think it's two of the ugliest words in the English language, natural resources. It, it 
pro propagates and it demonstrates a worldview that the natural world is something to utilize. Its value is what humans can get from it. Whereas the word taonga, treasure, something to protect, something with reverence is very different. And one of the other things to realize about the settlement process was that Auraki was formally renamed Auraki Mount Cook as part of the Naitahu settlement. It took that settlement, that legal process, to force the government to change the name. And we didn't get the whole name, we still have to share it. But in the next 50 years, maybe we can have more action where we don't have to share the names anymore. And that would be spectacular. All right, oh, far too long on important things. Let's talk about not important things. Um, <clears throat> so what do you do with this sort of thing, with this history, with this knowledge? So I run a tech business, we train programmers. This is my co-founder, Rohan, he's a lovely person. And so our mission is we take people who want to become programmers and very quickly get them the skills to, be, to join the tech workforce. And they get good salaries and they get jobs quite quickly. And most of them show up because they want jobs and they want to learn programming. And we have to spend a whole bunch of time saying, well, what employers really want is you to be a good human and you to be able to work well with other people. And a lot of time teaching human skills. So there's much more time sitting in circle and talking and learning with people than learning with technology. And so learning from the natural world and these systems, this is, this is why we do that. It's all those simple rules applied which has helped us get such a good result for students. We've trained about 300 students and they get jobs real quick. Uh, we've had the great fortune to partner with Māori over the last couple of years. And it's the, one of the, there's such a, the, the, how do we go about this properly? Like I'm Pākehā, I'm from you know, another country, I'm coming here and I would like to, you know, I see all these things and I want to do something about it. But there's the, the, the best simple rule I've found here is bind your futures together. It's, when, it's not when I'm here to help you, I'm here to take from you, or well, no, it's here when my success is bound to your success. And, when you can, and it's pretty easy to structure that. You know, we can all structure deals in that way. You might call them win-win, which I don't think is as cool. But it's like, how do you really deeply bind your success and your futures together? And when you can do that, it's amazing the support you can receive and the relationships you can build over time. This is one of our fantastic students. Um, I'll, I'll talk briefly about uh, Poe is one of the students who come from the East Coast, and her passion is to teach her people programming. She doesn't want a job with a tech company. She would like to teach her people to code so they can have jobs without having to leave, leave home. And one of the powerful opportunities with technology is that if you're serious about engaging in Aotearoa, engage in the regions as well as the cities. And if you can help get city-level salaries in the regional New Zealand, you would change the shape of this country. And it's, 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 not, it's hard to do, it's not trivial. But it's not, you know, we've done much harder things. Um, we had a bunch of graduates in Vodafone Foundation recently shipping things, which was quite fun. Oh, not much time. Uh, one thing about diversity that I found, or attracting people, is that it's about making people feel welcome. If you look at the tech demographics of the tech workforce, tons of, there, there are not many Māori, Pacifica women in the tech workforce. And you just need to make people feel welcome. There is a place for you here. We want you here. There are people like you here. And you can attract people. And it's not super hard. This is much easier than many of the other things. OK. So this is another simple rule from Facebook. Move fast and break things. If you're a programmer, this is a fantastic rule. Like, it's a way of keeping up your pace of innovation. And because if I break something in code, I'm just going to restart the server or I might reset my Git repo. And all of a sudden, no harm, no foul. We can just go ahead, move fast and break things. And it works really well in tech. And a lot of us who've come from a tech background, we're used to this way of working. Just iterate, 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 to hell with the consequences. Doesn't work very well when what you break is democracy. And <clears throat> there is a line of reasoning, which is the internet came along, and it was phenomenally innovative. And there is a whole bunch of companies which came from it, and those companies just tried to compete, and they tried to do things better. And if you remember placing ads in the newspapers where you call up classifiers and it kind of sucks, and now when you place ads and it's kind of awesome, and it's like that's so much better. It's just a better system for advertisers and advertisees. The consequences of that change is media companies losing massive amounts of revenue, desperate for anything which will get them ad revenue, and you start to see things like this where it's really good for CNN if a, a controversial president is running or a controversial president is in office. Their revenues go up, it's great. And no one wants bad things to happen. Everyone's just trying to do the best thing they can or the right thing they can. And it's just a consequence of a complex system. So 
I think this is relevant in one sense because we're just at the beginning of the disruption we're going to see over the next 20 years. And the technological change and the consequences of it, we've just seen the ripples. I think we've seen trial runs because now we're talking about financial systems and we're talking about governance systems. And I think there is a really uh, real risk of that when, uh, when Māori came to the Aotearoa, they were moa. So everyone's probably heard of them, massive birds, hundreds of kilograms, really good to eat, really good feathers, really useful, not very fast, very easy to hunt. And so they were hunted and they went away. At the same time, there was also the poakai, the great eagle. And it used to eat the moa, and when the moa went away, so did the poakai. I think there is a real risk that in today's society, things that we deeply value, governments, social security, education, are as going to become as competitive as the MOA was. And that the things we come will be demonstrably better and they will be able to outcompete them and the consequences will be significant. So for me, the simple rule about this is to reflect. Because if you think about who incurs the obligation to uh, clean up after innovation, self-driving cars are gonna come, millions of people will lose their jobs, is it the responsibility of the technologist to fix that? Is it the responsibility of the government? Is it the responsibility of society? Who incurs the obligation to create harmony when people disrupt? And I think that as this is a very powerful room of people, you have a lot of capability. Aotearoa is a small place. And it wouldn't take too much to disrupt things. So, I'd like to end with my final simple rule. This, one's a, this was one of the best ones I've had. And it's a quite a specific one. And so it's basically, whenever Yosef or Andre or Alina call me up and ask for something, I say yes. <laughs> and I say, how quickly? <laughs> and I think that that's a great simple rule for all of us because at the end of the day, it's about trusting people and working with people and building relationships over time that I think we can start to navigate a really challenging and a really potential, uh, amazing potential environment together, and it's through all of us working together. So, go on.